Welcome to the Craftsman Founder Podcast, hosted by Lucas Carlson. Every week, we talk to founders, entrepreneurs, and those who've made a craft out of creating companies and enterprises. Listen every week to get ideas for starting, promoting, and growing your business. There are no shortcuts, just good old-fashioned hard work and craft. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's interview. Hello, this is Lucas Carlson from the Crafts and Founder Podcast. This week, we have a really cool guest for you, Kevin Cruz. Kevin is the author, best-selling author, New York Times best-selling author of We, How to Increase Performance and Profits Through Full Engagement. Uh, he's written many books. He's a really great entrepreneur as well. And I brought him on because I think that company culture and startup culture is one of the most overlooked parts of building a company and if you really want your company to last if you're in it really for the long term and not for you know a flip a quick flip you're not trying to get rich quick uh, you really have to think about these things and so I wanted to talk about employee engagement uh, how to think about building a company culture uh, because it's it's definitely one of those things that very few people are talking about today in, in startups so, so, Kevin, thank you for coming on. Can you tell our audience about your background and where you're from, what you do? Yeah, thanks, Lucas, and thanks for uh, having me on your show. Excited to be here. Um, you know, my interest in uh, workplace culture and employee engagement and motivation, you know, really came from my own experience uh, as a serial entrepreneur. And uh, I, you know, started out um, <laughs> over two decades ago when I was in my early 20s and did the uh, the classic startup where I had no money, so I was living in my office, sleeping under the desk. I would wake up to go take a shower at the YMCA, come back to the office, you know, to eat the ramen noodles and all the whole the whole thing. And even though, and this was a time when I, I mean, you know, it, it it was a time when there was so much excitement in the tech industry. Uh, you know, Michael Dell was a young man. I saw Bill Gates at. Uh, up close at Comdex, it felt like I could not fail. But being young and dumb, I also always thought I was the smartest guy in the room. I thought I had all the answers. I thought, you know, it was my company. Um, so uh, I was greedy when it came to equity. I didn't wasn't interested in advisors or boards, and I would hire cheap and not treat the people really well. And that company went out of business after one year. <laughs> <laughs> You know, spectacular failure. And uh, I started up another company uh, with a partner, and we split split ways after about a year. But it, it we we didn't go bankrupt like the way I did the first time. And I was like, okay, you know, I get the this idea about you know having partner, not being all, all you know Grinch like. Third company was the one. Uh, it took me almost five years, but you know, grew to a couple million dollars, sold it for a couple million dollars had a small team of talented people. And again, I got more comfortable with realizing I don't need to do it all myself and the talent matters. Did the next company, got it over five million and sold it five years later. And that's really when I said, how do I attract the best talent and create an environment where they can, they can thrive? And then the last one I did, I said, all right, let me just peg the needle on this. I am not gonna be the guy out strategy, positioning, uh, I'm not gonna figure out any of it. I, if when it comes to marketing, I will hire a great marketer and and support them and leave them alone. When it comes to software engineering, design, etc., hire the best, leave them alone. So my job was find great people and create a workplace culture where they could thrive, and um, and that did did the best. You know, over 12 million dollars uh, in annual revenues after about four years, and I sold that company, and that was I guess about six or seven years ago, and so. I'm a little slow, so it took me two decades to learn that you know the less the less I worked in the company myself, and the more I worried about values and culture and all the rest, the better the companies did. Where where they were, you know, Inc. 500 companies, winning Best Place to Work awards, and I had very little uh, to do with it. So basically, Luke, to wrap up that story is is when I sold that last company, I said, okay. I'm not a consultant. I'm not a workplace consultant. I'm not an academic, you know, person. I'm I'm not a researcher, but how can I be like the translator? I've seen the power of how leadership, employee engagement can really drive 
innovation, sales, profits, et cetera. Um, how can I write a book that kind of translates this to, to frontline you know, managers, business people, and startups? And that was the book we, I thought it was only going to be a, a one and done, you know, topic for me. Yep. Um, and, and it turns out, you know, that book did well, that hit the bestseller list, but then people said, you know, it's a nice book, but it's this big. And what do I give my managers on Monday that they can, you know, implement right away? And so I wrote Employee Engagement 2.0, which was for managers. After that, people said, well, why is it always the manager's fault? Like, doesn't every individual have to bring something to the table in, on this topic? So I wrote Employee Engagement for Everyone, and that really is the last one on workplace culture and engagement. Not necessarily leadership, but um, I've kind of beat that horse. And uh, it's been gratifying because, you know, I just thought it was a good time for me to share my own lessons about workplace culture as an entrepreneur. Uh, but it's led to a lot of great opportunities and, you know, speaking gigs and things like that. And um, uh, and along the way, it's been fascinating, you know, as a, as a fellow author, I'm mesmerized by the publishing industry and the changes, you know, What's in the models. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, the book We, that was a traditionally published book with Wiley. Took a year of my life, lots of money and time and all that. Um, and then the other books were written literally in like long weekends and yep. they're thin and they're very almost like the way I would speak. Um, and, and the odd thing is um, when it comes to, to looking looking good, having a hard back book from Wiley, boy, that makes you feel good and it looks good. But if you want to make money and get speaking opportunities or other things, those thin self, self-produced, self you know, self-published titles are money. And that's oh, yeah. a... A funny, funny environment we're all in, but that's that's what I've learned over the last three, four years. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the way I heard um, one of my mentors put it was, you know, if if somebody had a pot of gold uh, and it offered you, you know, here's a 20-page book that explains how to get your pot of gold, or here's a 200-page book that explains your pot of gold, which one would you pick? <laughs> Exactly. It yeah. Seems like that's. Uh... <laughs> I would pay extra for someone to condense the wisdom, right? That's right. And and, and that's kind of sad. I mean, the first traditionally published book I did, which was about 15 years ago, I mean, my editor told me, he said, "Okay, you need to write a 400-page book. This is a nonfiction book." Now, again, young and dumb, I had no idea what I was doing, and I didn't push back. I said, "Well, I don't. Did you look at the the the?" table of contents, I don't think I have 400 pages of material. He says, no, no, I don't need to look at the table of contents. I want to sell your book for about $29. And if it's really thick, people will think it's worth that money. And I'm not making that up. Yeah. So he picked the page count based on the price he wanted to sell this unwritten book for. It wasn't about what's in the best interest of the reader, how fast can we go to market, how do you take um, you know great content and boil it down? It was all about fluff it up because I want a big sticker price on it. And yep. I don't think that's really changed a whole lot in the traditional publishing industry. No, that has not changed at all. It's, uh, but I think that we're seeing self-publishing change and morph the entire industry by force, by, <laughs> by pure yeah. force. Uh, so back to uh, workplace engagement. What would you tell an entrepreneur who, like, what's the biggest thing you could tell somebody who was in your shoes 20 years ago and was thinking to himself, well, I'm the one who knows best and nobody cares about my startup as much as I do. So, you know, why won't, if these people won't do it right, I'm going to step in, I'm going to fix it all myself because who cares about this more than I do? What would you, what's the, what yeah. could you tell somebody like that? Well, yeah, and, and, and that's right. It's a, it's a tough situation because not only for all the reasons you just mentioned, but again, as, as you know, you lived it yourself. You know, in a startup environment, there's always a million things to do, right? So, so there's the, the next release to, to get out in the world or there's bugs to fix. There's support problems. There's sales numbers to hit. You're trying to raise your next round. You got caught. Like, it's crazy busy, and, and that's definitely true. So for some guy, some old guy to say, hey, you really ought to take some time to think about workplace culture and engaging your employees and all that. Sounds crazy, right? It's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm paying them. They got options. Get to work. Yes. But here's the thing. As we also know as entrepreneurs, 
people get it now. Like, boy, you know, software engineers are worth their weight in gold, right? And it's yep. like, hey, you got a good 16-year-old engineering student? Can, can you can you homeschool so you can have a full-time job right now? Like, And forget about college. I mean, it is so competitive to attract engineers and then to keep them, right? So you need to be able to keep them. And and we know there's a lot of poaching going on in Silicon Valley and among you know tech companies. So if I really wanted to make the case to someone who was just kind of skeptical because you know she's a 27 year old hotshot with 10 people and has got a million other things to do, I would say, listen, if you it, it doesn't take a lot of time or money to create an engaged workforce, but you do need to be mindful about it. And what that's going to get you is it will help you to attract great talent your glass door ratings and word of mouth and all that are going to be great. And then once you've got them, people won't leave you. They're not going to leave you even if there's a $20,000 bump, you know, down the street because all of a sudden people realize how rare it is to work in a truly engaging workplace culture. So to me it's it's all about talent and whether it's hey, I'm trying to attract and keep my enterprise sales professionals or my software engineers, or my head of service. I mean, we all know that getting these people can make a big difference in the startup world. So that's the real reason why startup professionals would want to worry about it. So if if our audience is now convinced that they should uh, take care of this, uh, what are the first one or two steps to, to start ter- transforming uh, a work environment to a better place? Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's two ways to answer this. So, the research uh, from Gallup is clear that over seventy percent of how we feel about work has to do with our boss, our relationship with our boss. So, you know, if you're a startup founder and you got ten people, twelve people, all reporting to you, that engagement's clearly on you. Now, if let's say you've got a hundred people, and so your ten people are all managing teams themselves. You have very limited control over the engagement, even one level you know, down uh, from you. So you've got to engage your, the people that report to you, and then you need to teach them how to engage their, their frontline uh, talent. So, how do, so managers are key. That's the first thing you need to realize. And if you're the founder, the buck stops you know, with you. And then, I mean, this is based on my own experience, but also uh, when we did the book We, we did a survey of 10 million workers we looked at survey research of 10 million workers in 150 countries, massive, and said, who's engaged at work, who's not? Um, most people are not. I mean, in the United States, about 33%, one out of three people are totally emotionally committed to their company and their boss. About 20% are actively disengaged. They hate their boss. They don't like their company. They're looking for a new job. And the most, you know, 50% are just sort of floating in the middle. It's worse around the world. About 10% are engaged. So you've got to think about, okay, what as a manager can I do to engage my team members? And what we saw back from the, the, the data is the top three drivers of engagement are growth, recognition, and trust. Growth, I feel like I'm learning, I'm advancing, I'm being challenged. Recognition, I feel appreciated for all that I'm doing and, and my achievements. And trust is, there's a little bit of um, you know ethics and honesty and transparency. But it's also trust in the future. I trust that our industry has a bright future, our company has a bright future, and I have a bright future in this company. So it's about like a future confidence. And um, so as a people manager, and this is tough, again, in Silicon Valley where a lot of people are promoted for their technical skills. You know, you're a great engineer, now you're managing 10 engineers. Yeah. Well, that, <laughs> that might be good that you've got that core domain knowledge, but you need to now say, okay, but I'm now being paid to lead and to engage the, this, this engineering team. So growth recognition and trust, making sure people have opportunities to learn new, learn new skills and to advance. You know, the coders aren't especially aren't going to want to stick around if they're not working in the latest languages and, the, and you know, the, the, the coolest projects. Recognition, again, a lot of, you know, a lot of us uh, in, in tech are, are more type A or scientific, we're not people, you know, we're not warm and fuzzy. It just means saying thanks. It means showing recognition uh, when deserved. And, you know, trust is making sure that everybody in that crazy busy day-to-day, the quarterly sprints, the, the, the release after release, 
have that mission, vision, you know, big, hairy, audacious goal, as Jim Collins say, make sure everybody knows that. And, you know, there are companies that, that do this well, you know, and, and some big name ones, Silicon Valley, I think Twitter does it well, actually, in terms of teaching their managers, you know, how to do this. They do employee engagement surveys every six months. Most companies will do them once a year. Six months is a great practice. So they know the pulse of the company. Are people, you know, feeling pretty good or not? Or are there pockets of problems inside the company or what's not? A, uh, what's an employee uh, engagement survey look like? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, in like Fortune 500, <laughs> they, look, they look bad, meaning those companies hire outside firms, uh, Gallup or, or, or whatever, and they do these big surveys, 70 yeah. questions, 80 questions, 100 questions. Participation is low. The data is complex. It's not shared out. Yep. Great surveys, and, and the Gallups and the others, I shouldn't pick on them. I mean, they do have what, what they usually call pulse surveys, which are like shorter surveys. It's a survey that you know is delivered to all the employees that basically is saying, um, I, I think you can boil it down to a dozen questions or so. Um, you know, how are you feeling? How how engaged are you, are you at work? And you're going to ask uh, like proxy questions like, um, I would gladly refer a friend or family member to an open position in my company. You know, if you're emotionally committed to your company, you're going to be like, heck yeah, you know, come on, uh, Lucas, there's an opening in tech support. I know it ain't what you're looking for, but it's an awesome company. Get in here. You know, you're going to, you're going to advocate. Um, another question is going to be around in the last six months, um, uh, have you looked for, uh, have you actively looked for another job? Well, again, if you're engaged, it's easy to say no to that. If you're not engaged, it's going to, eh, I might've looked for another job. Might've been thinking about looking for another job. Are um, these anonymous surveys or are they kind of? Oh Yeah. Yeah. And that's where some companies will get in trouble. Like you, uh, really small companies, if they're on a tight budget, you can go to uh, surveymonkey.com and they even have a decent panel of employee engagement questions. So, hey, delivering your own survey with something like SurveyMonkey uh, is better than nothing. Go for it. The disadvantage is there's going to be those people who are like, wait a minute, this came from our own HR department and is going back to our own HR administrator. They say it's anonymous. They say it's confidential. How do I know that's really true? So it, it lowers the participation rate or skews the results. People won't be as critical. If it comes from an outside uh, survey company, then there's a, a, you know, more, uh, a better sense of trust. You know, it's going to say, hey, you know, we're XYZ company. We've been hired by your company. Uh, to, to give you this uh, employee workplace culture survey. It's only 20 questions, should take you 10 minutes. You know, all answers are anonymous. Only aggregated data will be provided back to the employer. That's the best way to do it, just to get, you know, really good results, honest results. That makes a lot of sense. So what are the top one or two big mistakes that you see people make over and over when they're trying to uh, turn around? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the, the biggest mistake that companies make uh, with employee engagement, why the needle is so low still, is even if they know it's important, even if they're doing a survey, what they typically do is the results come back from the survey company, fancy reports, charts, and that data gets hoarded by the CEO, the VP of HR. Everybody huddles around the table and says, Oh wow, you know, our engagement dropped year over year. We better do something about it. And then they brainstorm ideas, you know, we need another foosball table, you know, in the corner, or let's do another summer picnic for, for people. Well, it goes back to the problem of over 70% of engagement has to do with the relationship with my boss. So if Lucas is not a good manager for me, I don't care about the foosball table. I don't care about the employee picnic. If Lucas isn't changing, my engagement isn't changing. So the big problem is trying to do a top-down approach. The right way is to get that survey data and say, hey, Lucas, you got seven direct reports. Here's your... And is that above or below average of the other managers in the company? And we want you to share this data out, even if it's a bad score, and brainstorm with your team. So. 
your team dinged you on communication. That was your lowest score. Hey, you got to go and say, okay, what does great communication look like around here? And you get the answers from your team members, implement what you can. And when they survey again, they're going to be like, oh, wow, this is that survey that really does count. I remember the scores when Lucas shared it with us. He even implemented one of the three things. We said, okay, yeah, and you know what? I feel a little better about communication now. So that's the biggest thing. It can't be top down. It really needs to be a grassroots thing. You need to you need the participation of the of the team members. So this, so did, let me just um, echo back. So the scores are they on a per group basis aggregated? So it's not aggregated necessarily over the entire company, but uh, both. Just, okay, both. Okay. Yeah. So typically, what you'll do is. Um, depending on the size of the company. I mean, in a, in a giant company, I mean, they're going to have company score by division, by business unit. They're going to have it um, by, by country, uh, by, by job class, by demographics. But the key one is by manager. So you roll up the data into each manager. And you know, typically on these surveys, if you have, I think it's like four or fewer direct reports, you don't get your own score because... If you see the data from four people, you could maybe guess like, oh, there's one negative person here. I think that's Joe. You know, yeah. So it, it gets to be unhealthy. But if you've got five or more direct reports, then you would get a manager report that is the roll-up of all the people that report into you. Got it. And what do you do if you're the CEO and you're in charge uh, and your direct, one of your direct reports just can't seem to get it? Yeah. So, and, and that happens. So, you know, it, it's even in um, like uh, companies are doing a great job at this. They'll have what's called a 10 to one ratio, 10 engaged employees for every one actively disengaged. But that still means, you know, if you're a manager with 12 people, you could have one actively disengaged person on your team. If the CEO calls a town hall meeting and there's a hundred people there, there's 10 you know, Debbie Downers, David Downers in that room that still are actively disengaged, even if you're doing everything right. And so I get asked this by managers all the time, like, oh, I'm, I think I'm doing everything right and my score is really high, but there's one person on my team. What do I do to bring them around? My answer is you usually have to fire them. <laughs> and that sounds so harsh, but, and you can fire them in a nice way, but like that is a hiring mistake. That's a, that is, Either, now, you know, look, uh, engagement, how we feel at work impacts our personal life, but also our personal life impacts how we feel at work. This is really just life, right? I mean, it all impacts each other. So this is a person who either has issues going on or mental health issues or really should be, you know, working on themselves and it's bleeding into work or it's a cultural mismatch. You know, it's like, hey, um, I'm really angry every day because here I am, you know, coding JavaScript and I really wanted to be an architect, but my parents forced me to do this. Well, that's not your fault as the manager. You're never going to fix that, right? Yep. So, or, or even if it's, look, you're a software engineer, but working in an IBM culture versus, you know, a Facebook culture is going to be very different. So maybe you're in the wrong job, but the wrong culture. So. The best thing you can do when there's that one out of 10 or, or whatever it is, is identify them and have an honest conversation. Say, I'm going to pick on you again, Lucas. I was giving you all the props for now. Oh, my boy, here we go. <laughs> so you say, hey, Lucas, listen, you know, you, you, we try to create a great place to work around here. Most people see they're working hard and maybe to, sometimes they're a little stressed, but we know, we know that they're really committed here. And I'm, I just don't get that same level of commitment or sense from you. And often Lucas will say, look, you give me my paycheck, I'm giving you 40 hours or 50 hours, we should have no problems here. Well, you gotta, you come back and say, listen, this is a culture, this is a company where we think everybody is a leader because emotions are contagious. Emotions are contagious. We want people who can be emotionally engaged. So, you know, I just wanna explore this with you. Is it a mismatch with our values, with the project? Is there something missing that we can work on together? And if not, like if this is just a mismatch, if this wasn't the job you thought it was when you came on board, if you're not the person we thought you were when we hired you, well, let's work something out. And whether that means, you know, finding another place for you in the company, if it's a big company, 
or giving you some time to, to look with a good severance package. But that one in 10, you're, you, like, you can't focus on turning them around. You want to invest in the people who get it, who are actively engaged. You want to drag the people who are sort of in the middle and get them up, but you're not going to get that one out of 10 person. You really need to find a way to, to move them out. What about the um, what about managers that can't seem to figure out um, how to make their employees' work life better? Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. A great case study, pro- I think, the best when it comes to workplace culture and engagement is um, actually Campbell's Soup. So years ago, Campbell's Soup almost went out of business around 2000. Lost half their stock price in a year. Sales were tanking. They fired the CEO, brought a new guy in named Doug Conan. He was told he had the worst for, the worst engagement scores in the whole Fortune 500. That's how miserable everybody was. Wow. So his turnaround plan, he announced, was resting on employee engagement. Everyone thought he was crazy. Like, wait a minute. These, these miserable old timers in this 150-year-old soup company, you're going to get them all jazzed up and excited, and that's going to turn Campbell Soup around? Well, he got them to this crazy like 23 to 1 engaged to disengage ratio it took 10 years wow. but every year they would double boom 2 to 1 4 to 1 8 to 1 right on up and i had a chance to talk to him about this and and you know he did the surveys he he rewarded people for it he trained managers how to do it but he said what people don't usually write about when they talk about Campbell soup he he said he fired 300 of 350 frontline managers and he didn't do it right away but like okay everyone i'm the new guy in town and it's all about engagement you need to engage your teams and, and we're going to measure it a year goes by they all stink hey guys this ain't going away this isn't a one-time you know initiative and by the way all your bonus is now tied to it and we're going to give you whatever support you need training but this really counts year two goes by and they still ain't moving the needle okay guys listen you might be a great manager somewhere else, but you're not the kind of leader we need at Campbell Soup. So let's agree to part ways. He ended up letting go 300 of 350 managers. Wow. So I, I think the sad thing is, is that managers are the key, but how many managers have ever been trained in this is how you engage your team? This is how you create emotional commitment and a great place to work. Uh, you, you know people want to, to grow. Here's five ways to help them grow. You know people like to feel appreciated. Here's 10 different things you can do to show appreciation. You know, they get all kinds of training in, you know, di- good topics. Diversity, time management, delegation, project management, all these things. But nobody's getting trained in how to create a great team environment, a great team culture. A lot of them just have it. They get it. But... If you're not engaged yourself, it's pretty difficult to engage those who are reporting to you. And we know half the people out there aren't engaged. Yep. Wow. So what are some companies that uh, do engagement best? You, you, you surveyed a bunch of them. So who's, who's on the top? I mean, you know, there's uh, – if you look at any of the public rankings of best place to work, great place to work, et cetera, I mean – those are the companies are, that are doing it right. And it's anybody from a Genentech, you know, giant uh, biopharma out of San Francisco, South San Francisco, um, that invests so much in their people. And, and that's the other thing that, like, um, uh, the head of training at Twitter told me, you know, she, to, 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 in my mix, she's like, hey, great people want to work with great people. So that's the other thing is in, engagement starts in the hiring process. You want to hire people who want to be engaged, who are going to bring their A game every day. And so Genentech makes a big deal about that. I mean, they invest a lot, and they're always ranked number one or two, I think, best place to work you know, in, in, the, in the California area. Um, there's, uh, but, but it's not always the flashy companies. I've um, uh, spent a lot of time with Union Pacific Railroad. Wow. So, <laughs> I mean, they're just moving fuel and oil, a big giant freight company, and yet they are passionate about engagement. Why? Because when you're engaged at work and you're mindful at work, first of all, safety is number one. You're working on a railroad, safety is paramount. That is always number one, and they're breaking all kinds of awesome safety records. So if you're engaged at work, 
you're paying attention. You're not walking down the tracks checking your text message, right? You're not um, forgetting some procedure on the cars. You know, if you're engaged, all of a sudden your behaviors are um, consistently safe. But they're also doing it for things in any industry. Engagement will trigger uh, discretionary effort. So a, a big cost, if you're running a giant railroad, is fuel costs, moving the trains, driving the trains around. So they're always banging on their engineers about managing fuel. And it's kind of like the same principles as if you're driving a car. So they'll say, all right, engineer, listen, Lucas, when you pull into this train station, if they're not ready for you to pull up and it's going to be more than five, 10 minutes, don't just sit there idling, running the air conditioner because you're burning fuel. Shut the engine off and then start the locomotive up again when they're ready for you. Or, all right, Lucas, you know, there's a, you see a big curve coming up. You can just fly right into it and then apply the brakes and then gun it out of the turn. Or you could coast into it and ease out of it and manage fuel costs. So engaged railroad engineers conserve fuel. And so Union Pacific's doing a great job with that. So there's all kinds of positive case studies. Unfortunately, they're in the minority, right? Yeah. I mean, there's still too many companies where the CEO is like, oh, this is all about making people happy. I'm supposed to make people happy these days. I give them a paycheck. <laughs> they give me 40 hours. That's what I used to call happiness, right? <laughs> so we got to overcome all of that. That's why I'm like beating the drum. That's why I'm spreading the gospel about it. Yep. Well, I think that that's just as true for small companies as big ones. Mm. So what, uh, do you have any parting thoughts? What's next? What are you working on? Well, <laughs> I mentioned I spent the last, you know, four years writing three books on employee engagement, and I've got some leadership books in the works, but um, I'm about two months away. This is just a passion project for mine. I wrote a book uh, on time management and productivity, and usually when I say that, people are like, who needs another book on time management and productivity? And what I found, I mean, this was a personal transformation for me. I mean, when I was young and dumb and trying to figure it all out in the startup world, I mean, I was that guy that was crazy busy, working every minute. I didn't exercise because I was working. I wasn't eating right because I was working. And it was horrible. It didn't yep. work out. Yep. By the time I figured it out, like that last business, getting to, you know, million plus a month in a few years, I, I was eating great. I was working. I was spending time with family. It was completely balanced and peaceful. It was completely different. And none of that had to do with any of the traditional time management things that you hear about. So what I did for the last year is um, I interviewed seven billionaires on their time management productivity secrets, including um, uh, Dustin Moskovitz and Mark Cuban. Um, I interviewed, I think it's about 13 Olympians, Olympic athletes, about how they approach their schedule and productivity. Um, I got 29 straight A students from Harvard and all these medical schools. All right, how did you manage time being a straight A student you know, at Harvard? Um, and then I, I interviewed uh, 239 entrepreneurs and said, give me your best time management productivity secret. And so I gathered all this data, did some survey research of about 3,000 professionals, and studied it. And, you know, I'll just give you a preview, Lucas. Nobody's using a to-do list. No <laughs> one said, oh, the secret to my success is I've got a to-do list. You know, um, Mark Cuban isn't walking around all day looking at his to-do list and ranking items as like A1, A2. That ain't happening. Yep. So people who go to these time management trains, I mean, we've been lied to, you know, our whole lives. It's, it's, it's not about time. And, and another, this was a surprise to me because um, a, a lot of the things that came back are stuff I, I was doing. But when I asked the 239 entrepreneurs, I'm like, hey, give me your best time magic tip. I thought they'd give me a little hack about email or the importance of the calendar. A huge chunk of them said, it's my morning ritual. It's my morning ritual. And I'm like, whoa, like I, I, I read Hal Elrod's Miracle Mornings and I've got my own ritual that I do that I just thought was like a weird thing. It's like, I ain't going to tell anybody that I like have a minute of gratitude every morning. That's kind of weird. And then I meditate for like five minutes and then I just do a quick 20 minute treadmill. They're going to think I'm a freak. Everybody's doing it. This, these morning rituals was like a big aha that everybody's sharing. So 
wrote a book on uh, the 15 secrets that highly successful people know about time and productivity. Awesome. And uh, I don't have a firm launch date, but I'm hoping for September. Cool. Well, that sounds excellent. And uh, I'd love to have you back on to talk about those when it comes out. You got it. You got it. Great. Well, it's been awesome having you. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thanks, Lucas. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Craftsman Founder Podcast with Lucas Carlson. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass along our web address, craftsmanfounder.com, to your friends and colleagues. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a Craftsman Founder production. Join us next time for another edition of the Craftsman Founder Podcast.